Today is March 30, 2018, and tonight we are going to be continuing on our discussion from last weekend regarding Revelation in light of the most recent new moon topic. So let's ask our Heavenly Family to guide us. Heavenly Family, thank you for giving us opportunity after opportunity to learn. Thank you for correcting us on so many wrong principles by which we have been operating. And please open our eyes to see any wrong principles that we're operating by now and teach us to walk according to the ways of truth and love and only the ways of truth and love. Please help us to understand the revelation more clearly and help us to see how it relates to our own experience today. Teach us any and every lesson that we need to know from it. Thank you. We ask this in the name of Branch, she and she. Amen. Amen. All right. So in brief recap, Part of our recent new moon study was related to Revelation and we mentioned Revelation chapter 10 and its fulfillment as being a circumstance or rather a set of circumstances where the activity of our heavenly family is evident. Now, We have been focusing uh, last weekend, and we started to discuss it. uh, I'm thinking we started to discuss it prior to that as well, unless I'm remembering that correctly. Either way. I think it was just last weekend. (laughs) Maybe just last weekend. Okay. Um, Since our new moon meeting, we have discussed the book of Revelation further, and it's something that we want to keep in mind to do. In general, when we have a new moon meeting on a given topic, to have at least elements of the topic that we continue to study and the new moon message to be not lost sight of throughout the rest of the month. And typically, we haven't been specifically doing that on the calls together, though we've mentioned that it's important for people to do. but. I think it's definitely a positive thing for us to continue things related to the new moon topic throughout the month. So there are lots of things that we could be looking at related to the new moon topic, but what we have been looking at is the book of Revelation and trying to get a broader understanding of this writing as a whole and kind of uh, asking some of the questions concerning it that we have learned to ask about any other writing, such as, who wrote this? When was it written? To whom was it written? What was the purpose in writing it? Those sorts of basic questions are ones which we're not used to asking when reading the books in the biblical canon, whatever biblical canon a person happens to have. And we've seen in regard to other writings, the value in it, and in regard to some of the writings within the canons of Jews and Christians, we have seen the advantages there as well. For instance, the Torah or the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, we've asked some of these questions concerning that collection of writings And it has proven to be very, very fruitful there. And uh, that's what we're doing with the Revelation. And we've kind of just focused on the first chapter so far, and we're not necessarily intending to study through all of Revelation together on the calls or anything like that, but we're getting somewhat of a better idea. And... Some of the things that we have discovered are that 
the first three verses of Revelation chapter 1 do not claim to have been written by the author of the rest of the book. Rather, that section is simply an introductory remark, which is basically written by someone who was involved in distributing it. And it refers to John in third person, and it seems to have been written sometime shortly after John, the author of Revelation, died. And, again, sometime shortly after he died. Um, verse 4 of chapter 1 begins a letter, which is said to be from John, to seven churches or seven groups of people in Asia, which was a Roman province on the north of the Mediterranean Sea, just to the east of the Aegean Sea. And this letter does not specifically identify who this John is, and this is something that we uh, have discussed a little bit and which needs to be discussed more. Which John is this? Is this a John that we know of from elsewhere in the New Testament or from other writings of the time? Do we know anything else about this John other than the fact that he wrote this letter to these seven churches and that he had this visionary experience that's recorded in Revelation? Those are all kind of issues that we need to further discuss. We've talked about the dating of this writing to some extent. We found that scholars generally tend toward one of two times. It's basically unanimously agreed that this was written in the first century of the Common Era. The traditional view, going back to the end of the second century, is that it was written probably in about 95 or 96. So that's in the reign of Domitian at the very end of the first century. But there is another view, and that is that it was written probably during the time of Nero, more specifically between the years 64 and 68, some say. Now, these are just the two common views that are out there. In me mentioning them, I'm not saying these are the only two views that we should consider. We need to study the book and find whatever the evidence indicates. Maybe both of those times are incorrect. Who knows? That's something for us to keep in mind. One of the things in Chapter 1 that we discussed that may be an indication of the date, not that it was written for the purpose of indicating a date, but it gives us some information by which we may derive when the revelation was written. And specifically, it is in chapter 1, verse 7, it says, Look, he, referring to Jesus, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him even those who pierced him. And on his account, all the tribes of the earth will wail. And we discussed how this passage would come across to its original hearers and how this doesn't give any sort of explanation of those who pierced him seeing him because of them being raised from the dead or anything like that. And without that explanation it would come across initially as being a false prophecy to someone who heard it after those who pierced him had died. So because of the fact that it's written in such a simple form, even those who pierced him will see him, with no added explanation, it seems more natural that this would have been written while those who pierced him were still alive. And we did some figuring based on 
kind of youngest possible age or youngest average age of the Roman soldiers who pierced Jesus and how long they would have tended to live. And basically at the, the far extreme, they would have died in about the year 80, more likely maybe between 70 and 80. Um, but obviously we don't know specifically for those specific soldiers, but the year 80 of the common era would be the upper extreme. So if this is to be taken as any sort of indicator of date, then it definitely favors a date prior to the year 80. So those are some of the things that we discussed. And we've discussed other things about Revelation more broadly, such as how it ended up being included in the canon, quote-unquote, and so on. But what we really want to focus on is whatever anyone here may have found regarding Revelation. And specifically, we're talking about things in chapter 1, not saying that no one can mention anything from elsewhere, but it is, of course, nice to have somewhat of a focused study and, and all of that. And where we left off is in looking at chapter one and discussing its contents to see what it might indicate to us concerning who wrote it, when it was written, where it was written, to whom it was written, for what purpose it was written, and, you know, just anything that we might be able to discern about the contents of the first chapter and its meaning. So, with all that said, what we did the last time is have someone read the whole first chapter just so it's fresh in our minds, and then we went from there to discussing it. And I'd like to ask the same thing. Is there anyone who would be happy to read the whole of Revelation chapter 1. I will read it. I'm going to read it in the King James, just because the last two times it's read in the NET. So, just for something different. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, Grace be unto you, and peace, from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, 
and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive for evermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Okay, thank you for reading that. Clearly there are a few differences between the King James Version and some of the, and the NET Version, which is what we've read. And I was following along in the New Revised Standard Version, and there were a few differences as well. Overall, it's pretty much the same, but like there's a place in, uh, I think at the end of 18 in the King James where it said Amen, which is not in the New Revised Standard. And there are some other changes even just in punctuation that change the meaning of things to some extent. But um, in any case, all the different versions should be looked at and considered because everything is a tool in order to access whatever it is that John actually wrote, whoever that John was. (laughs) So with that said, does anyone want to mention anything that they have found regarding the first chapter of Revelation? Oh, I have an observation. Um, uh, I got it wrote down here. In the first six verses, Christ the Son of God is named and established. His testimony and various descriptions and praises to him uh, 13 times. So, I believe this implies that it's an important message. Okay, so you're saying the first, in the first six verses, there are like 13 different praises? Uh, yeah, the description, right? testimony, um, his name, who he is. Okay, yeah, well, this is, I haven't personally counted, but it's definitely uh, claiming to be a revelation from Jesus and also from the seven spirits before the throne of God and from he who was and who is and who is to come, who is uh, identified as the Almighty in verse 8. Um, and so it's this is definitely... Uh, Christ-centric, for sure, and this also is apparent continuing to read in chapter 2 and 3 as Jesus, as the Son of Man, gives messages to these seven churches in Asia. So, uh, any other comments? Okay, um, I was just really curious on looking up the island the island of Patmos, right? 
And um, I found something in the internet, and it's under a website um, by Christian Apologetics Ministry, and they're dedicated to demonstrating historical re reliability of the quote-unquote Bible through archaeological and biblical research. And I don't know what this is all going to imply, but there seems to be some indication Okay, that, okay, first of all, it's a common tradition um, that is known that the island of Patmos was a sort of like an Alcatraz type barren rocky um, island used to exile prisoners, right? And the archaeological findings there show, and literary findings show that there was actually three temples, Roman um, god temples that were on the island that people would come there to worship on. So that's one, um, you know, evidence that shows that, okay, it could not have been a barren and rocky, desolate place. And another thing was they found uh, what's called a hippodrome which is like a horse racing, um, you know, a horse racing, uh, what, uh, I guess, um, you know, one of those horse racing places, right, um, where people would come. So that's another, uh, yeah, horse racing tract that people would, you know, come and enjoy. And so that's another issue there. And there's other things here. Just give me a second here. Um, and they found like an ancient administrative center in a military center because I guess Patmos was very, uh, it was a very strategic location for, um, you know, watching uh, ships or, you know, boats come in through the harbor, right? And they found fishing and agricultural um, activities on the island, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that, you know, I just thought that was really interesting, and I don't know what that's going to imply. But at the same time, um, I found a professor from University of Edinburgh who did an extensive um, paper, and she called it Life on the Islands. And she described the islands that were considered exiled islands in the Roman Empire era. So um, I was looking it up. I couldn't find it. So I ended up emailing her, asking her if she could send me a PDF of her writings. And she actually did. It was quite quick. She she wrote me back in two days, and, and she gave me a copy of the PDF. However, the only negative thing was that she only, uh, well, not quite negative now, but um, she only went as um, she only described the details of the exiled islands during the Julio-Claudian um, dynasty, which is the five emperors before Nero, and Nero being the last. So just, she just went up to uh, 68 AD with her stuff. So, and if we're, you know, if we're taking a look at John um, existing up to 98, it wouldn't include that. But it could give us some, you know, some sort of um, uh, clue of what what not. But and the other thing, though, although Patmos was not a barren, rocky, let's say it, what if it wasn't, it still does. I figured out that it still doesn't. Um, it still doesn't exclude the fact that it wasn't an exile island because there was actually three types of exile uh, categories that the Romans um, implemented. And it, it goes, there's three of them. So the first one isn't as severe, the second is medium, and the third would be severe. And the first two 
would mean that they could exile people. Hey, Anna, just in case, uh, just in case you can yeah. hear us, we can't hear you. Are you there? No, we lost her. Okay. 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 Um, well, just in case she doesn't know that, we're just going to send her a quick text. So one second. Okay. So apparently, she has actually, her call is no longer connected, and we did send her a text, so hopefully she'll call back in in a minute. Um, she probably will. I know she has another means to get on, and Tuesday night she had a little bit of technical difficulty, got knocked off a time or two, and came back on. So since she's still in the middle of explaining her findings, I think it'd be good to wait a little bit longer. Yeah, I think so, too. Hi, right, then. In the mean... Sorry, yes, hello? Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Yeah, concerning when, it, when the elevation was written, uh, there's where in the road. I think it, there are several places in the road. Where it says the, it is 96 AD. Uh, how do we confirm that? Because the, the prophet can not just come up with that 96 AD out of uh, out of the blues and say 96. So how do we confirm whether that is true? And we can't say it is false because it is you can't you can't just guess from now. Okay, so um. We see that Anna's back on, so I'll just really quickly comment on that, Jaffet, and then we'll go back to what Anna was saying. So Jaffet's question is basically there are three places in the Rod literature where Victor Hoddeff mentioned that Revelation was written in 96 AD. So how do we either establish that or, or verify that one way or the other and if it's incorrect, how do we deal with that? So ultimately, it's actually a pretty simple principle involved with this, and that is that Victor Hoddeff was merely repeating the common understanding of the day. This has been the traditional view in Christianity ever since the end of the second century. So that's been many hundreds of years that Christians have uh, said that, and it's based off of a statement by a church father, Iranius, who said that Revelation was written at the end of the reign of Domitian, who was a Roman emperor, and his reign ended in 96. And so usually because Iranius said that, again, he, he wrote this in about the year 180, so that's the end of the second century. and. Other church fathers followed his, um, I guess, his idea concerning that, whether right or wrong. But anyway, that's been the common understanding, and so Victor Hadoff was merely repeating that. Victor Hadoff very clearly expressed that neither he nor other prophets um, spoke only that which was dictated to them by angels or anything like that, but that they also spoke the common understanding of their day. A great example of this is how in Shepherd's Rod Volume 2, Victor Hoddeff stated that the stone of Daniel 2 represents Jesus at his second coming. And later, when Victor Hoddeff had light on the meaning of Daniel 2 and the stone of Daniel 2 in particular, they abandoned the other idea that the stone represents Jesus at his second coming, and when asked about this, Victor Hoddeff said that since they didn't have any special light on the topic, and since they had assumed that what the denomination, the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, was teaching was correct, then they merely repeated that common understanding. And so it, he said that since the idea did not originate with the rod, 
the rod should not be held accountable for it, especially seeing as once the rod received light on the topic, it abandoned the popular theory and went on proclaiming the truth. So, again, Victor Otto's statements regarding Revelation being written in 96 are not unique and original to him. It's merely repeating the common understanding, not only of Adventism, but of all of Christianity. And Victor Hodoff stating that has no, uh, gives no indication as to whether or not that's true. It only lets us know that it's the common understanding of the day. Um, so that's it. <laughs> but, uh, Oftentimes, people want to, Davidians, uh, obviously, want to claim infallibility for Victor Hodda's statements, even though they're very happy to recognize that Ellen White wasn't infallible because the SDA denomination will often claim that Victor Hodda contradicts Ellen White. But as Davidians, we would say, oh, no, 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 he was just shown more light on the subject, but... Um, Myself included, prior to becoming a Branch Davidian, I would use the double standard of saying it was okay for Victor Hodef to have further light and kind of seem to contradict Ellen White because she didn't have light on the subject, but I wasn't willing back then to concede that the same could be possible about Victor Hodef. So even though it happened even within Victor Hodder's own writings exactly. concerning himself, but we always just thought, well, he was allowed to correct himself when he received more light on it, but no one else can come along after and correct yeah. any misconception that he may have had, because, of course, he died without any misconceptions on anything. <laughs> so really, the, the way to know how to answer almost any question First, we have to understand the principles which govern the truth, and then we will be able to um, explain the details of the truth to a person in a way that will actually help them. Because if we were only to address the specifics of a seeming contradiction, but never address the underlying principle, a person's just going to keep coming at you with question after question after question along the same line. They're going to have this objection. Well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And, I mean, we've all done it as Davidians, and we've all seen it done by Adventists and Davidians and even some professed branches. And when we understand the principles of how to come to know truth, and how inspiration actually works, then there's not a problem in understanding the specifics of a situation. It becomes pretty simple to deal with. So anytime someone asks you about, you know, a specific passage or a specific question, finding a way to incorporate the principle which governs the knowledge of the truth for that question is really essential um, to make sure to have in your response. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's the best way to help people who are asking. So, for example, if we did end up concluding, like if we really studied Revelation and found that all the evidence from within Revelation indicates that it was written in the 60s, and I'm not saying that that is the case, I'm just saying if that turned out to be the case, and if a Davidian was to really object and say, well, Victor Hoda said it was 96, really the best way to help them would be to show them the principles, and obviously showing them Victor Hoda explaining the principles is the best for for a Davidian. Yeah. Um, and, you know, specifically the principles that show how messengers deal with the common understandings of their day. And that would really show that there isn't really a conflict because Victor Hodef wasn't trying to make any sort of point about it 
or to make some sort of strong claim about, well, oh, this is when Revelation was written or, or anything like that. It was just an incidental statement relative to some other subject which he was really focused on. So, I hope that that helps to answer the question, Daffit. So, since Anna's back, and she was in the middle of explaining things, are you good with going back to Anna now, Daffit? Uh, still on the, the the same one who gave the date. I don't know whether you were saying it's Arrhenia or so what. Uh, uh, are we just going to just brush him off to say what he said in Hebrew is just common understanding? Or are we going to test him also to, to see whether what he say what he said is done, stands or falls? Yeah, so because we have to test the, the claim that he made, whether it is true or false. Uh, I don't know how you look at that. Uh, I would definitely say that every claim is to be tested, but I would say that Victor Hodef's comment of Revelation being written in 96 isn't actually a claim that he's trying to make. It's just an incidental statement that he's making that's merely repeating the common understanding. So it's not his claim. It's the church's claim, the church tradition's claim, going back hundreds and hundreds of years. And so, yes, that claim does need to be tested, and that's part of what we're doing in looking at Revelation to see, well, was it really written in the time of Domitian, or was it written at some other time? Was it 96, or was it some other time? But if it turns out that that claim is false, it's not Victor Hodef's claim that is false, because Victor Hodef isn't the one who made that claim. He merely repeated it because it's really the common understanding throughout the whole Christian world. So, I hope that that helps. So, um, Anna, sorry that you got bumped off, but we're glad that you're back on the call and hopefully you remember where you were at yeah i do <laughs> i do i was explaining the differences of exile during the roman empire um they went from you know least severe to severe and so you know it's not a just a a one set um type of exile where you just sent to a rocky barren island like we think in our day I believe um, but back then it was different stages of exile um, different categories so so that's another thing to consider um, and the destinations of exiles I'm just going to do a quick read in um, the professor's writing here she said location matters that was a basic principle for exiles right their destination greatly affected how well the condemned could cope the places that were commonly used in the early imperial period are varied, though they are most often islands. For many of those who were sent away from Rome in the early imperial period, however, we do not know exactly where they went. Often, it is simply stated that someone was sent to an island. And some of the islands, you know, I was reading about it, some of the islands weren't all barren. Some had access to necessities. Um, some had, you know, they even found villas. Because, granted, most of the exiles back then were very prominent um, Romans, right? And the whole purpose of exiling someone is so that they lose, they, they are removed from the capital, and they would lose their influence of prominence amongst the people. So that was the whole pur main purpose of the exiles during the Roman period. Um... Just trying to think what else I wanted to say about my findings. And yeah, I guess that's about it. So I don't know what the implications would that be, but I just thought that was interesting. I don't know if anybody else thought that interesting. I thought it was. I did. <laughs> 
Hey, uh, a couple quick questions, though. Um, what is the name of this professor again? Yeah, her name is S. Bingham. Um, she just, um, she's a professor in the uh, Historical Classical Archaeological Division of the University of Edinburgh. That's what she, um, yeah, she's good at. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to get her name. And uh, the other thing I wanted to clarify, does this or does this not include the time of Nero? Because I think at one point you said it doesn't, but then you said that she goes up to the year 68, and Nero started ruling in 54, and he ruled from 54 to 68. So, yes, exactly. Um Sorry, um, no, because I had in mind um, of placing John and this revelation during the time of Domitian, which was late, you know, in the mid 90s, right? So I was totally excluding Nero's um, era. But now that, yeah, you mentioned tonight that there are two places where we could place this, and that's in the time of Nero and or in the time of Domitian, then. Yeah, this might be a helpful um, piece of evidence here. So, okay, so it does actually cover the time of Nero, correct? Yes, the Julio Claudians is from the five emperors before and up to Nero. Okay, cool. Um, so, so that's pretty interesting. And uh, just to clarify too. I did mention that most scholars place it either in the time of Domitian or in the time of Nero, but we should have a broader investigation in mind that it could be in the time of some other emperor. Um, so, yeah, we'll just keep that in mind. Yeah, those aren't the only two options, necessarily. Right, yeah. They're the two most common options. So, um, the other question I wanted to ask quickly is, uh, now, I don't expect you to be, like, super well-versed in whatever this article is from this professor, so I don't expect you to be able to, like, repeat stuff from memory or anything like that. But I do wonder, I'm not, I'm not at all, like, saying that this isn't the case. It's just, it's so important for us to be acquainted with the evidence, whatever the evidence is. So these three types of exile, does she give evidence of that from the ancient sources themselves? Yes, exactly. She uses Tacitus um, in there. She uses Suetonius, right? These are the Roman historians. Um, and I, did she even use Pliny the Younger... But yeah, that, her main sources are those Roman historians. Suetonius, Tacitus, and I believe Pliny the Younger is in there too, she must mention. But I see Tacitus and Suetonius a lot in her footnotes. And from what you gather, do Tacitus and Suetonius, or whichever other ancient uh, sources, do they actually describe there being three types of exile, or is that the professor's construction of it in saying, well, sometimes this is how exile is described, sometimes this is how it's described, and so is it is it the professor who's dividing it into three categories, or is it the ancient sources that divide it into three categories? I believe it's the ancient sources. Um, she gets the three named um, relegatio, which is the first, the least severe, aqua et ignis interdicio, right? And then deportatio is the third one. So, yeah, she's getting these um, from the uh, historians. And I believe I've, I have read it too. Before I read hers, I 
actually did read that in one of the historian's uh, writings, but I just can't um, exactly remember who in, in, in the reference numbers and pages and stuff. So. Okay, cool. Thanks for mentioning that. That's great. Okay, uh, does anyone have any other comments, whether on what Anna said or something connected to Chapter 1? Uh, yeah. In reference to the question, who, um, or who is John, um, I've been reading several um, scripture references to Spirit of Prophecy, and I've been able to connect with the name John the words Beloved, Patmos, and Apostle. in the same sentence or in the same paragraph. And when you say the same paragraph, like in terms of an Ellen White quote, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Like so one reference may may use uh, beloved John or the beloved John. Uh, another reference may have John and Patmos telling that he was exiled to Patmos and a, a little bit of a story about that. And um, another reference had John uh, being described as a, an apostle. Okay, so um, I want to comment on this in terms of the principles involved. And I, I hope that I'm able to do so in a way that really makes sense. So something that we have to keep in mind is that, okay, yes, definitely Ellen White described the John of Revelation as being John the Apostle and described him being exiled to Patmos and all of that. However, that identification of John the Revelator being John the Apostle is not something Ellen White came up with. This is church tradition going back to the second century. Because of that, we cannot use the fact that Ellen White repeated the common tradition in order to answer the question of who wrote Revelation. Because, again, it's, it's just expressing the common understanding. This is not something that... Ellen White is making as a unique claim. It's not like she was given a message that the author of Revelation is John the Apostle. You know, Ellen White and Victor so, so since said, she didn't, she didn't witness. It's, it's uh, technically it's hearsay. Uh, in a way, um, that's not how I would put it, though. It's just. I mean, I guess in a way, hearsay is an okay description. It's just that it's it's the traditional view going back yeah. for hundreds of years. And, you know, there are many things, like there's a statement from Ellen White where she said that Jesus rose from the dead on the second day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And Victor Hoddoff had to address that question on several different occasions because Victor Hoddoff so clearly taught that Jesus rose from the dead on the fourth day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, the last answer out of a series of questions that Victor Hoddoff was asked on that subject, the last answer that he said is that, well, if the Bible says that he was raised on the fourth day and Ellen White says that he was raised on the second day, they both cannot be right. And the point is, what Ellen White said was actually just based on the common idea that the wave sheaf was offered on the second day of the feast, because it says that is to be offered on the day after the Sabbath. And traditionally, people thought that the Sabbath there was the first festival Sabbath, not the seventh-day Sabbath. And others thought it's the last festival Sabbath. So there's actually three different views concerning when the wave sheaf is offered. 
And the common one in Ellen White's day, and before and since, is that the wave sheaf is offered on the second day of the feast. And since she knew that Jesus rose the day the wave sheaf was offered, she said that he rose on the second day of the feast. But that's not correct. That's not correct according to the Gospels in the New Testament, and Victor Hadoff really showed that. But again, Ellen White was merely repeating the common understanding of the day, so she's not supposed to be judged on that, just like an ancient writer of uh, a book that ended up in the Bible saying that the sky is a solid dome. That doesn't mean that the sky is a solid dome. It just means that they shared an understanding in common with everyone else in their day and that God didn't correct them on it. And so, of course, they're going to say that the sky is solid because to do otherwise would be insane. <laughs> you know, it would just be yeah. totally out of keeping with what everyone thought in their day. So same thing, you know, with Ellen White, yes, she definitely thought that John the Revelator was John the Apostle. And she also thought that the author of Hebrews was Paul. And Victor Hawk thought that too. Why? Well, simply because you open up your King James Bible or your revised version or whatever, most of the common translations available in their day, and it says, the epistle of Paul to the Hebrews. But nowhere does Hebrews claim to be written by Paul. That's not actually something that Hebrews claims. It's not a quote-unquote scriptural thing. It was just the traditional view, and Ellen White and Victor Hadoff shared that traditional view. So that's why when we're examining something like, hey, what can we learn from Revelation? We have to make sure to look at Revelation itself rather than seeing what Victor Hotta or Ellen White or anyone else had to say on it who may just be repeating the common understanding of their day. And in fact, even though I'm saying, that, like, I do believe there's a lot to learn about Revelation from the writings of Victor Hoddeff and Ellen White, but when we're coming to do a fresh investigation of a writing, we need to rid ourselves of all preconceived ideas and all biases, so we need to learn to not look at it through the Branch Davidian lens, or through the Davidian lens, or through the Adventist lens, or through the Christian tradition lens, or whatever. We just need to see, look, right now in material reality, we have in front of us a translation of this ancient writing called Revelation. By studying this writing, what can we learn concerning it? Like, what facts can we actually derive about the past from what we presently have before us? So that's what we're really attempting to do in these meetings, to see what can we show about Revelation from Revelation itself or from something else that we can actually demonstrate to give us factual information related to Revelation. So we, we need to approach it from the perspective of this common material reality that we all share rather than looking at something that requires someone to share a presupposition with us. So hopefully that so helps we need, to, we, need to, uh, we need to consider the source. Uh, and consider, you're saying like consider Ellen White's source or something? Well, like you said, she was using the, the uh, traditional knowledge. Yes. So not, not, not to question Ellen White, but to question um, uh, her source. And her source being... Uh, a traditional view rather than a solid uh, demonstration. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good way to put it. It's not about questioning Ellen White. It's questioning her source. Just like there was a time where Ellen White said, 
that there was a certain number of rooms in the building and she was depending on uh, the pamphlet from the building and she got the number of rooms wrong. Why? Because the pamphlet had it wrong. Yeah. So she was just going based off of her source and the fact that she made a statement that later was shown to be incorrect because of her dependence on that source doesn't mean that she made a false claim. It means that she repeated someone else's claim mm -hmm. not knowing any better. And so she shouldn't be, you know, held at fault for that because, hey, in reality, this is the way that it is. You know, if you go to a... Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll put it like this. Let's say Teresa and I go to the grocery store and... And, uh, we're looking at different vegetables to get. And I go over and I check out the cucumbers and I come back with no cucumber. And I say to Teresa, all the cucumbers were rotten. Um, you know, we don't really want any cucumbers. And then let's say, uh, Annalisa asks us, Hey guys, you know, at, at the store, did you happen to notice if the cucumbers were good? And Teresa says, Oh no, the cucumbers weren't good today. Okay, well, that, that's just a very normal event. <laughs> like something like that may happen. And Teresa may just be repeating what she got from her source because she said, okay, well, this source is generally reliable. And so for this relatively meaningless thing, I'll consider that generally reliable information. And she may pass that information on to someone else and if it ended up being that, man, I missed one and I thought they were all bad, but there happened to actually be one good one there hidden under the others. <laughs> it's not like, yeah. you know, like Teresa should be held accountable for passing on wrong information to Anna concerning the cucumbers or something like that. You know, it's just those are relatively insignificant things. And the fact is that it's not like we can practically go through life like questioning every claim in our whole surroundings. I mean, it's good to question everything, yeah, but you have to kind of establish probabilities and you have to establish levels of importance. So it's kind of like about the cucumbers, that's not all that important. Like it's probably not worth the time yeah. For everyone to go and check every cucumber to verify it and all of that, like, okay, so what? You know, it, it really isn't the biggest issue. And so because it's of little importance and because, you know, you're just establishing probabilities, you're not trying to make some sort of uh, definitive claim about reality or something like that, yeah. then you may end up repeating that common information and it may end up being wrong, but I think we all get that that's not the biggest deal. I, I do think we should strive for accuracy even in the small things, but I'm just saying it's not. There is right. a gradation. You know, it, there is a gradation of what's really important and how we deal with things that are less important. Uh, you know, we may, it, it just doesn't make sense to take as much time on the less important things in terms of really verifying things with solid evidence. So then when we're investigating, we need to take our uh, discernment and uh, take it to another level. Absolutely. So it's like, you know, when Ellen White is mentioning something, Try to look for what is her main point that she's getting across. And if the authorship of Revelation is secondary, like if that's something that she's just mentioning, and if we can also show that it's just the common understanding of the day, well, she may just be repeating the quality of cucumbers. You know, like she's just saying the common understanding. And it mm -hmm. wasn't really important to what she had to say to right. go and really investigate is this common understanding correct and you know what we are doing on these calls we are really investigating a lot of things that 
past messengers haven't investigated and questioning a lot of assumptions. But notice we're, we're actually, like, we're not taking the time on these calls to go through every claim out there, like, uh, is there such thing as chemtrails or is there, you know, whatever. Like, we're not going to break open all these conspiracies or whatever to investigate each one together on the calls because, you know what, we have more important things to look at and these are the things that relate to the messages that our Heavenly Family has given to humanity. And so that's why we spend our time focusing on different writings and on different principles. And the reason why we are opening up all these different questions that past messengers didn't is because it's, our Heavenly Family has seen that it is the time to break us from some major incorrect paradigms of how we view everything, like scripture canon and materialism, you know, all of those things influence how we view everything else. And so they have shown us those things like, hey, guys, this is what materialism is all about. And hey, guys, this is really the nature of the scripture canon. And this is the nature of inspiration and et cetera, et cetera. And that's going through these other things, whether it's investigating the virgin birth or whether it's mm-hmm. investigating who wrote uh, Revelation or the community rule or whatever. All of these things are important in their own right, but it's also just to show us how we need to apply these basic overarching principles that they've shown us, and we really do need to apply it to everything. So, yeah, I hope that that's helped everyone to really understand what we're doing here. Yes, and and by the way, um, the um, references that I read uh, that included the, the name John, um, the name was just in passing, and and she had a viewpoint or a principle uh, to relate to us in in each one of the different quotes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that. So, John, John being, you know, whoever John is wasn't the focal point. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, this happens all the time in Adventism and in Davidia where people get into quote battles. Well, this quote proves my point. And then the other person, yeah, well, this quote proves my point. And, you know, going back and forth, just debating over quotes. And so much of the time, people are using just some side issue in the quote rather than actually reading what the author is talking about and trying to understand the ideas that the author or the authors are expressing. We get caught up in just, you know, the minutia of little side things and forget what's actually being spoken of. And so that's, we really need to stop doing that because ultimately it's like, man, yeah, there's so much to these statements. It, yeah, it'd be one thing if, let's say, Ellen White or Victor Hada or someone else wrote an article about who was the author of Revelation. Or when is Revelation to be dated? You know, if they wrote something like that and were making claims and they're actually addressing the issue we're discussing, well, yeah, let's, you know, take a look at that and take it really seriously. But, you know, when they're just talking about something else and they happen to mention something on the side, it's like, okay, that's not really the best way to address it. And Victor Hodov actually says this somewhere. He said that when we are trying to find an answer to a question or when we're studying an issue, we ought to go to the statements which deal directly with that subject. And so, yeah, that's that's really what we need to do. Um, 
Man, there's a lot more that could be said, <laughs> but I'm noticing that it's uh, 9.08, at least in the Eastern time zone, so we've been on for over an hour now, and so we should start to wrap the meeting up, but before we do that, I just wanted to ask if anyone else had any last comments or questions that you would like to make within this meeting. Hello? Yes, hey, Javit. Uh, what about uh, in the Dead, dead Sea Scrolls? Uh, and there are some fragments of the same revelation, so that so as to determine when it was written, like in, by archaeology and the other means. Okay, so um, let me just ask you to clarify your question. Are you asking about how we could determine when the Dead Sea Scrolls were written, or are you asking whether there were fragments of Revelation in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and if that can help us to know when Revelation was written? Yeah, do we have some fragments of the same Revelation? Okay, uh, yeah, so we do not have fragments of Revelation in the Dead Sea Scrolls. In fact, there are no writings of the New Testament that are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Likewise, there are no writings of the followers of Jesus found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Most of the Dead Sea Scrolls were written and copied prior to the time of Jesus. There are some copies of texts that are contemporary with Jesus from his own time, that are found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and some that come up to like maybe the 50s or 60s of the first century, but those are copies of writings that came prior to the time the copy was made, and none of them mention Jesus or any writing or figure uh, prominent in the New Testament. So the Dead Sea Scrolls aren't really directly useful in dating Revelation. I don't know when the earliest fragments of Revelation come from specifically, though I believe that they're from the second century of the Common Era. So, yeah, the second century AD. So we know, we do know, based off manuscripts, all we can really say is that it comes from before the second century, it comes from the first century, and I think we can also generally know that based off of the writings of the church fathers, because they refer to Revelation, and they quote Revelation, and so obviously it had to be before their time that Revelation was written, but we can't really get more specific than that. All right, well, with that said, um, would anyone else like to either make a closing comment if you have one that you really want to make during this meeting? If not, hey, we're coming back tomorrow night and we can discuss all this further. Um, so if no one else has anything, would anyone like to thank our Heavenly Family and then we'll end the meeting? Okay. <laughs> Heavenly Family. Uh, I thank you so much for um, just setting forth and teaching us more principles about um, your work through the prophets and how we are to understand that and how we can go forward learning more. Um, I thank you for setting these things so we can um, be freed of some preconceived ideas about prophets and um, their writings. So, um, so you can lead us and teach us more and more truth. So that's so awesome. And I thank you so much for that great gift you have given us um, through the present prophet. And uh, we ask you hand a blessing upon us in the name of the branching sheet. Amen. 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 I really enjoyed tonight's meeting. I think these were good comments, good questions, and good discussion. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Good night. Have a good night. Love you all.